high volume, high frequency training, old school bodybuilding methods. You've heard me say that over and over again, but you might not actually know what I mean by that. In fact, a problem that I've noticed recently is most guys fail to build muscle in the gym, not because of effort or lack of work ethic in the gym, but because they take on a training idea or methodology and they apply it completely incorrect because they actually didn't understand the principles behind it. Recently, I did a video on why HIIT training won't work for you. And in a quick summary, the reason is because most people's perception of what failure training actually is, is just inaccurate. And then without understanding the main goal behind the program, they execute the plan incorrectly and don't get the benefits from it. At the same time, anytime I make a video on high volume training and compare it to HIIT training, I get some of the same comments over and over again. I get guys swearing up and down that naturals can't recover from high volume training, or you can't train high volume and high frequency frequency together or high volume leads to overtraining. First off, no. I've been training with this system for years. Hitting body parts two to three times per week, hitting a high number of sets, most taken just shy of failure. The clients I work with using this same system, they all get results, natural or not. In fact, high volume training has produced more Mr. Olympias, more champion bodybuilders, and dare I say it, more muscular physiques even among the average population. More so than HIT ever has. There's just no disputing that. Look at the numbers. But this video is not a HIT versus volume debate. So let's just leave it at that. The point I'm trying to make here is the reason that people either perceive high volume training as overtraining or for enhanced bodybuilders only is for the exact same reason that I argued that HIIT training won't work for you. Your definition of high volume training is completely incorrect. Many people will follow up my argument on high volume training and they'll say something like, you can't recover from 30 sets of chest and then grow. And that right there, that's the reason high volume training doesn't work for you. No one said that you should be doing 30 plus sets of chest. In fact, go pick up Arnold's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding. Read up on his system of training, the one that everyone loves to hate and call overtraining. Arnold himself has written in there that he believes anywhere from 12 to 20 sets per body part to be considered high volume training. That's actually not that much if you think about it. Most people in the gym, they're easily hitting three to four exercises per body part with three to four sets per exercise. And on top of that, I don't even think many of them consider what they're doing high volume training. And many of the same guys that swear up and down by HIIT training or low volume training, they're performing six to nine working sets per muscle group all done to failure on average. And many of these guys even train with a higher frequency. When you average that out across the week, it's not uncommon for some of these low volume guys to be doing 10 or more sets per week. And when we're strictly talking volume, that's generally calculated on a weekly basis. And when I personally use the term high volume, I'm talking anything above 10 working sets per week up to 20 and consider that high volume. Anything lower than 10 sets per week, I'll consider that low volume. Now again, when I'm talking about high volume training, that can go as high as 20 plus sets per week. It also doesn't mean that that's what's mandatory to grow at all. So now, if I take on a client that's looking to build more muscle and I have him do, let's say, 14 sets of chest per week. We're talking eight sets on Monday and six sets on Friday. That's not that excessive. And when we combine that method with reps in reserve, which I generally keep one to two reps in the tank on most working sets, we drop off a ton of fatigue that would come from failure training or even beyond failure training. Now, that type of volume, it's much more tolerable and in many cases, less systemically draining than 10 all out sets to failure. And for the guys that have to be convinced that the sets not taken to failure still count, look at all the bodybuilders from the 60s and 70s using high volume training and almost no sets taken to direct failure. And even if you look at many guys who claim that they do follow a low volume, high intensity approach, look at most of their sets. Lots of them, they're not actually training to absolute failure. And in many cases, if you really look at their training, the majority of the sets, they're leaving a good one to two reps in the tank. Very rarely does anybody in the gym actually take a set of barbell squats to true muscular failure. Before the quadriceps ever fail in a squat rack, technique will start to break down first, the lower back and the hips kick in, and the cardiovascular system will start to fail. Everything but the actual quads are starting to fail. And out of safety reasons, you end up racking that weight. But despite the fact that the quads are not actually failing, the barbell squat's still an extremely effective mass builder for the legs. And you're actually getting all the muscle building benefits that you need out of a hard working set while leaving that one to two reps in the tank, even if you 
perceive it as a set to failure. What about movements like pull downs or lateral raises? Yes, of course these exercises can be taken to failure, but most people are stopping these sets when form breaks down and there's no other clean reps left in the tank. And even if that movement is taken to failure, meaning you can't produce another clean rep, that doesn't mean that the target muscle is failing, as there's many more supporting muscles that come into play. Regardless of how that set ends, if you're performing that set with a high level of intensity, you're still stimulating the target muscle to a large degree. The point I'm trying to drive home here is, on many of these exercises, even though you're failing, the target muscle you're training might not be the muscle that hits failure. Think about that the next time you perform a hard set of rows, lateral raises, or similar exercises. Now, when we put all this together and we really understand that a good amount of hypertrophy can occur even if sets are taken near failure, and we combine that with more weekly sets and or higher frequencies, recovery doesn't end up being as much of an issue as we think it'll be. In fact, recovery might actually be higher now that you're forcing your body to respond to the demands of higher frequencies and volume. Your body will always attempt to respond to whatever you throw at it. It's called the repeated bout effect. But for all this to work, you must be able to balance your weekly volume or total working sets, your training frequency or how many times per week you hit that body part, and your average intensity per set, how close you take it to failure. Those all need to be balanced to make high volume, high frequency training work. And many will come into this style of training with their own preconceived notions of how hard each set should be or how many total sets you should do. And what they don't understand is once you start adjusting all of these variables to make the system work, you can do a lot more in the gym than you think you're capable of. And in my experience, time and time again, produce a greater amount of muscle gain because of the higher stimulus. If you're looking for my exact recommendations to build your physique using time-tested, proven, old-school bodybuilding training methods, I recommend you check out my five-day old-school mass gain program in the description below. And as always, if you guys want to see more of the best original bodybuilding content just like this, make sure to hit subscribe.